Good evening and welcome to Studio 10 Talks. I am Patrick Cassidy. I am the artistic director for Studio 10. It is so great to be back here because we don't get to do this show weekly anymore. We haven't been doing it for a while. Why? Because we've returned to live theater. And we just got finished uh, at Studio 10 doing Smoke on the Mountain here. And we did it at an 1871 historical site church, which was great for this bluegrass gospel show about the Sanders family. It was such a hit and we had such a great time. And uh, and we're getting ready for, oh boy, we're getting ready to premiere a brand new Dolly Parton show. Here you come again on May 17th. We're gonna talk about that later. Um, but I wanna get right to, I wanna get right to the show because our guest is, is incredible. What a talent. Um, she actually uh, starred in six Broadway shows, including uh, Anna Karinina, my Fair Lady, High Society, Amour, for which she received a Tony nomination, Dracula the Musical, and Irving Berlin's White Christmas. She also played Cosette in the national tour of Les Miserables and was hand-selected by Mr. Sondheim himself to play Dot in Sunday in the Park with George at the Kennedy Center. On television and in film, you may have seen her in Billions, Central Park West, The Good Wife, on the Rocks, Life or Something Like It, Blue Bloods, Mismatch, and Law and & Order. And she is a prolific concert and recording career, um, a star that includes albums and songs by Stephen Sondheim and Michelle Legrand, and is one of the most beautiful people on the earth, both inside and outside, according to our producer, Julie Garnier, and I'm about to find out. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Melissa Errico. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Yep. Whoever wrote that. <laughs> you're a nice writer. <laughs> you have much to live up, up to right now. <laughs> yes. Yes. So good to see you. So good to be seen. Thank you. Thank you. How are I you? Can't, I can't believe. Okay. So I have to start right off by saying this. And if you don't, it's great. We're just going to go. Do you remember when we met? No, for me, you're so famous and iconic that I feel like. Oh my God, she started off so good. <laughs> <laughs> we met, we met, um, I came to see my very good friend, Malcolm Getz, and you, and my very good friend, Charlotte Moore, at the oh. Irish Rep, the very first time you guys did Phineas. Oh, my God, okay. Because you went on to do it a bunch of times, right? Yeah, I sure did, yeah, wow. I saw it, I saw it the very first time, and I was like, kind of in awe, like kind of gaga backstage when I... Oh, wow. I can't even remember a time in life where I wouldn't have had you in my consciousness. So I... <laughs> well, <laughs> you just, you know, you know, God, it just... It feels no, so I mean, it's, it's like so... Um, but right. I, I, I love... I lo I'm still working at the Irish Rep. I'm in rehearsals for um, uh, uh, the play Dear Liar. Dear uh, Liar, that's right, yeah. I was, yeah. I was, gonna, I was actually going to plug that later for you and I will indeed, yeah. but yes, I know. And you've worked and you've worked there, I guess a lot, right? That's been something over the years. I did. I think you can say that, um, you were an athlete. Yeah. Big time. Right? Big mm -hmm. time. Um, it's like training, you know, it's like going back to, um, you know, the best coach ever. It's like, it's the, it's my foundation. It's like every single, it's almost like it's calibrated me throughout my whole career. So whatever I've gone out and done, whether it was something uh, very pressurized or exciting in the concert world or um, Broadway show, or even a period of time in LA and television, I've always come back to the Irish rep. That's great. That, so it's it, so you, you your chops up. It, it's like doing repertory theater. It's like doing repertory theater. I've done straight plays, you know, Shaw play, a bunch of Shaw plays, Oscar Wilde, musicals. I did Finian's Rainbow in my, I feel like I've done it in my 20s, my 30s, and my 40s. And uh, they asked me to do it again. You know, I was, I just, that's when I started my writing career because I, at that time, had been writing for small magazines and um, even online, things like Playbill and so on. And I had been writing for, for some magazines and I'd written for Variety and things like that. And then Amazingly, I got asked by the New York Times if I'd like to to uh, contribute oh wow. contribute an essay, and they asked me what was going on in my career at that time. I said nothing, besides children and being too old for Finian's Rainbow, because <laughs> they keep asking me to do it. I did it, you know. I played these roles in my teens, and then in my professionally in my twenties, my thirties, my forties. And I said, the ingenue police are at my door, <laughs> knocking. <laughs> uh, look so, at you there. 
God, there it is. There it is. Is, uh, now, is, is, that, is that Milo? That there is Milo. Correct. Milo did Milo did mass appeal with my brother Sean, the national tour. You're missing my 20s. You have my 30s and 40s there. Wait, wait. Um, and that's there's Finian's again, right? Yeah, that's my 40s. <laughs> <laughs> so my first what? my first piece was about aging and as an ingenue. And you know, all the things you mentioned, Cosette and uh, My Fair Lady, and I did do the Hollywood Bowl and in, in the Hollywood a neck of the woods where you have spent, I'm sure, a good deal of time. Um, <laughs> I played Maria in The Sound of Music and I did Eliza again. I did Guinevere in Camelot. So I played all these parts, but I was just, by the time Charlotte asked me to do Sharon again, I said, I'm going to get arrested. <laughs> that was well, my first, my first. Well, time. you were wonderful the first time. And if it's any consolation, I played Joseph and his amazing technical dream coat at 44. And I was in a lot of tanning cream and a lot of contour. Uh, so, um, so okay. Now, do you remember the second time we met? No, this is like you're trapping me on TV with this. I no, I, I just, I just clearly, you made the biggest impression on me, and I made none on you. No, it's not that. Is that for me? It's like hello, hello, like, but it's and, and that's exactly how it was. They were yeah. both just like that. The second time was I came backstage at uh, Dracula because I knew Kelly oh. and I knew Tom. And I said, I do, I just want to, oh, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I kind of got ushered into your thing. There were other people there. There you are. Um, and here's good. the thing. I, I was a bit, I'm, am, I was, am a big fan. And I thought, um, and you couldn't have been sweeter and kinder to me. When you did, you're always, nervous. You're always nervous when you're there. It's like, you know, Patrick is here. I feel like if I were to say a time where we met, I think this would all be different. But, you know, it's always like kind of exciting when somebody knows you're there or you're in the room or you're in the house or he's in the audience or. Yeah. Well, as I said, it was purely because I'm a big fan. You're, you're terrific. I want to but I want to I want to go because I got a bunch of stuff I want to talk to you about. First, I want to just talk about you were born in New York City. Yes. And you That's went to cool. high school at Manhasset while taking dance something, is that right? Well, I actually went to high school in Locust Valley, um, but I um, uh, grew up in the town of Manhasset, which is an old Indian name for exit 36 on the Long Island Expressway. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, and your father, orthopedic surgeon and a concert pianist, right? Correct, correct. And I'm in the department right now. Sorry. Yeah, my father is a concert pianist, and he is also a doctor at the hospital for special surgery. My father and mother are of Italian American uh, descent. They have relatives that came over in the beginning of the um, 1900s from the south, the southern tip of Italy. Uh, there was a shipwreck actually, and they ended up in Boston by mistake, and they found their way by some form of bus to the Bronx. So my family is Italian American with a very colorful history of survival and not speaking English and having just a few boxes of things. They came from a vineyard life, and mm. two of the girls were very beautiful, and the oldest daughters. The father was a a. a I was gonna say he's a scallion, but that's not true. There's he can't be a scallion. He was, I think, a rap scallion. I'm thinking of a fancy word for he was a not a nice person. And he played the mandolin and wasted a lot of money. A rap. I know there's a funny word or a, a, a colorful way of saying uh that he was a rascal, but my brain is pushing a lot of words together right now. But anyway, he was a real character and blew all their money and then took everybody to America and then dropped dead when he got here. So then the two eldest oh, oh. sisters were beautiful and they decided to go into show business. They didn't know how to speak English and they were singers, dancers, sort of hat check girls at child's restaurant. And would you know it, Ziegfeld discovered my grandmother's sister and she became a very accomplished Ziegfeld girl in all the follies. And she was- I, in I, I, I you know. know about her. She did Showboat on Broadway. She did, did. Ziegfeld the Night Frolic and she did Smiles. Right? She sure did. Yeah. So I had well, a really colorful, you know, sense of being an Italian, but an immigrant and um, 
from well, a we side have, of New York. We have a little video to oh. see you both your parents. So let's see, let's take a look at that, Jules. Okay. Dashing through the snow in a one horse open sleigh, o'er the fields we go, laughing all the way. Bells on bobtail ring, making spirits bright. What fun it is to laugh and sing a sleighing song tonight. Oh, oh my, that is so, that is precious. It's hard to it's hard to even explain though. You see that that's a Christmas show, but that was in the worst of the pandemic in 2020, and I hadn't seen them, and I didn't see them for a really long time because the following Christmas my husband had COVID and my mother was just bawling. And well, this was this was this was the Christmas before, and we were still obviously we'd been separated. I hadn't seen them in forever, and I said to my dad. You know, I kept trying to stay in touch with my parents. And I said, you know, Dad, we used to sing together when I was little. And I had that little bit of um, whatever that's called, Super 8 footage or something. Mm -hmm. And um, so I was asked by the Bay Street Theater to do a live stream with no rehearsal at all, straight to Zoom. Ted and I did it all by the by Zoom. And then we got together, but he stayed far away. There were camera crews. I was alone in this in the Bay Street Theater, never said hello to any human being mm -hmm. and beamed my father in on that tape and I sang live and he pre-taped it. It was just so sad and so touching. So to see that footage, it may not look professional, but it was um, oh, it's beautiful. It's, it's great. beautiful. And it was so it was so hard to be set. Oh, we all felt it. I hear you. When I moved to Tennessee four years ago, two months before the pandemic hit to run a theater company, well, that's how this show was created. This show, by the grace of God, came out of the fact that I, as the artistic director, could no longer produce live theater, right? What do you do? And I, and they they could have closed the company. or they. So I came up with, we did fundraisers virtually. We did a contest for young kids that didn't get cast in their, or, or couldn't do their spring musical. And we created this talk show and people like yourself Friends, yeah. new colleagues, all stepped up. Anything, everybody who called me, like now that you know me a little better, like you can, I do everything like to help. And I, I try during the pandemic to say yes to every artistic situation where they wanted to keep spirit alive, ideas alive, um, intellectual, uh, you know, lyric, uh, what was it? Uh, I, the, the French Institute, Alliance Francaise, I worked with Adam Gopnik and mm -hmm. we did this beautiful lecture series with song. I felt like that was my best service. Well, well, you, uh, well, okay. I, I, I have to talk to you about this because I've got a couple of surprises. I want to. I mean, first of all, your Broadway debut, or what was your first job? It, is it the the Great Space Coaster? Is that right? Well, that's my first professional job. You know, like, <laughs> I was a kid. I was a kid actor, and that was a spinoff of the Muppets. Uh huh. Wow. <laughs> this little show, actually, and there Did you was. Sing on it? Did you get the same? I, did I sing that song? It's a very good question. I think I sang my own theme song. I, that's a good question. No one hasn't asked me that in so long. I, I have the footage. I think I did sing the theme song. It was about bullying. Like oh. you in Griddle Gorilla's pocket was a little computer. Like here I have my off screen makeup. Oh. Um, Oh, that's Lee Miz. But like it was like a little box and you would open it. And I lived inside with stories about middle school bullying. Oh, my gosh. That's that's charming. I like that. It charming. It was so charming. But it looks like you jumped to my teenage picture in as Cosette. In yeah. Lake Which you, now, you, I didn't realize you went to Yale. Yes. I did go to Yale. Yeah. I was I, an art history philosophy major at Yale and I dropped out in my freshman year to star in Lee Miz. Wow. And it was at National there you are, a national tour? The first national, which uh, though there doesn't sound like there should be a difference, at the time it was the most lavish tour 
Oh, I known to man. The premier okay. national company was very different than a national tour. Wow. It was a Broadway show of the highest caliber. Sure. Every, every week in a new, or every. No, 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 no. We stayed four months in a city. Oh, each city. Those, those the are the best. Were like a week. They had the full everything. That's it. And so then your first, uh, and I, <laughs> Julie was messing with me. Your first Broadway show was, I kept going, Anna Karina. No, it's Anna Karenina, right? Well, Anna Karenina, yeah. Anna Karenina is Tolstoy's novel about this unhappy uh, woman married to a military man who uh, distresses her so much, uh, or not a military man, maybe he's a lawyer, but then she falls in love with another military man, Vronsky, who's awfully handsome and more her age, and they have this passionate uh, relationship, and it doesn't go well. She's... Um, Part, she's separated from her son. The shit hits the fan. Vronsky is not interested in her after they go to Venice um, and give up every lady-like thing one can, including one's marriage and social position. And she ends up jumping in front of a train. Obviously, I, I never read the novel in school. <laughs> Holy it's smokes. It's, good. It's, it's, a great, it's, a, it's a big suicide novel, but it, it's a, one of the hottest sexy novels in literary history because her feelings about Vronsky are really passionate enough so that she'd ruin her life. Sounds perfect for a musical. Perfect. It sounds perfect for a musical. Here's the funnier, the funnier, weirder thing is that I was at Yale. I had not, I'm going to confuse myself. I, I think I came back. Oh yeah. Yeah. I had come back. I did my Yale education in two and a half years. I had accelerated. I had a quick run at Yale. I, I, I did work really hard, I loved my schoolwork. But as I was graduating from Yale, I auditioned to play Anna Karenina. I was 22 years old. I was so into it because I had read the novel and I was obsessed with this kind of stuff. And I got the role in the workshop at 22. Oh. Now, Anna Karenina is like a, like a, a not a middle-aged woman, but she's a mother with a lot of problems and a lot of, uh, sexual feelings, you know, <laughs> she's not allowed to have. And I'm 22 years old, you know, I know nothing about anything. And um, so you weren't allowed to have any sexual problems at 22. I got the part in the workshop. Wow. I had the weirdest time doing the workshop, and so did the creative team because I loved it. And so when we went to Broadway, they were like, you can't play Anna Karenina, but we know you love this show. So they gave me the other role as the ingenue which was Princess Kitty. And you can look in the in the playbill. I was the understudy to, Aunt, to Anna. I was decades too young, but I loved it. And in subsequent years, I did the cast album mm. for it. And, and Anne Crumb was beautiful in it and uh, has passed. So I had this opportunity to sing the, the role, but she was amazing. However, I loved it as well. And that's what the story is. And so I played Kitty and um, and it was really fun. I loved it. Oh, it's great. It's it great. was at the Circle in the Square. I love that. Oh, I love that. I love that. Love and that. you know who, who directed it? Even though it was, it was a, you know, not a successful musical, it was a, a repertory company, the Circle in the Square. So with the, the commercial pressures were, were um, not as high. Ted Mann, who created the Circle in the Square, was the director. Wow. So we had, a, we had a wonderful creative team. The orchestrations were done by Peter Metz. Oh my God, I've worked with Peter, he's great. He's the best, oh, yeah. one of the best, one of the we best ever. Creative team, um, you know, so strange. You did, so I wanna, so you also did, obviously, I didn't get to see you, I would have loved to have seen you as Eliza in My Fair Lady. Was that for you, Richard Chamberlain? Was he Higgins? Well, I did it with Richard Chamberlain. I did it also with Michael Moriarty when he replaced him. Sure, and then sure. I, I did it with John Lithgow. Oh, wow, wow. That was, that was, I was, uh, let's see if you have John Lithgow. I'm not sure. That on the right's not even a production picture. That was a rehearsal. Um, so I might, no, don't look at it. I, I hate that. My hair's, <laughs> I think I did my own hair. That have was you a, done, wait, I'm sorry, Melissa. Have you done every, like, have you did, did you do Julian Carousel ever? Did you ever do Lori in Oklahoma? Did you do the, the ones that my mother did? The, no, I didn't actually. I do them all the time. Those two in concert. Um, yeah. But I did do Brigadoon. Um, I think I've done most of the Ingenue roles a lot. And I recently wrote, um, you know, it's like the last 
since I've been a mom and stuff and writing more, yes, I have been working and I have done some television and some plays. I've really started writing my own concerts and writing my own uh, cabarets. And I just recently wrote one that was about doing the ingenue roles. So it's just interesting you should ask. I wrote a one woman show called Terminal Ingenue, The Miseducation of Melissa Errico. <laughs> And it's, it's all about the cul-de-sacs we find ourselves in life, the bad choices, the, the funny things, the absurdities, and the serendipities, you know. The right. most serendipitous part I ever had was Mary Martin's role of uh, Aphrodite, Venus, in One Touch of Venus. Well, I want to talk about one thing because I have a surprise for you. First of all, uh, I want to talk about Amour for one minute because uh, two of my very, very close friends, uh, both who I've worked with, uh, both uh, Malcolm Getz and Norm were in there. There you are. And uh, and I never got to see the show, even though I heard from everybody. It was it was fantastic. And um, and tell and I want to show this little clip, Julie. Do you have a little clip of, of a more for a minute? mysterious husband has secrets of his own me i have my daydreams until they all come true we are the people you're likely to meet we like to work the street i'll paint you beautiful views garish concoctions of yellows and blues we are the people you're likely to meet we like to work the street Oh, wow. That was a surprise. Oh, oh. Ladies and gentlemen, Julie, will you bring on our guest? Malcolm. Uh, <laughs> Malcolm Getz, ladies and gentlemen. Where did all my hair go? <laughs> Hey man, look at hey, you! Man. You look good. Oh yeah, hey Melissa. Hi, oh, my love. love. You look beautiful. I haven't, I haven't seen Malcolm in so long. Malcolm, it is so good to see you. It's good to be here. Thank you for having me. Oh my know. gosh! Tell me, guys. Tell me about this experience. I know it wasn't the first time you worked together. Maybe the first time on Broadway, but it wasn't the first time you worked together. What was it like? We worked together a lot. I yeah. think I've worked with more than any any other single actor or actress. I love him like he's other, I don't know, he's like my soulmate. I'm Patrick's understudy, so. No, I, you are not, no, vice versa. Uh, I, told, I, told, I told Melissa earlier, I said, I saw you both the very first time that you did, I came to see you, Malcolm, because we had done- well, Malcolm always had all the famous friends, you know. <laughs> he's so nervous. Oh, Malcolm. So when did we first work together? I don't know. We met in college. We, yeah, we met at college, but then we worked together on Triumph of Love, a workshop of that. It was the first time. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then one. Amour, I think, the workshop. We did one of the workshops of Amour. And uh, I was thinking today, we, we did workshops for like a year and a half before we went into, into production. And then, of course, they changed everything in previews. And Melissa and I had a title song called Amour. And two or three weeks into rehearsals, into previews, they rewrote the song. The lyrics were exactly the same, but it was a different tune. And we learned it and sang it that night. That was crazy. I had a lot of songs like oh that my because God. my character, they oh gave my God. character a fetish for traveling around with like People Magazine, Paris Match. Like she loved gossip magazines. So I always had a magazine. That's because I had the lyrics inside the book. The I did that too. I put my myself <laughs> Well, you had the newspaper sometimes, right? Yeah. I learned so much from you. Were so, you're, you're so beautiful and everything. You were so beautiful in the world. I mean, just seeing that clip reminds me of like your voice and you, you look the same, honey. You look exactly the same. Uh, you know, Malcolm, thank you. But I love Michelle. I just don't know what it is. A lot of things about Broadway, you know, are intense and like freak me out. Mm. We were just so happy to sing that music. It was just, I, I just mm. don't read. I remember, you know, half hour, we were just like, hey, and we were just not like, let's get ready. You know, we were like, I don't know. Patrick, the first preview, Scott, uh, what's Scott's name? Scott did the set. 
Pask. Scott Pask did the set. It was beautiful. In the first preview, 30 minutes into the show, I was singing direct address to the audience, and I heard the screaming, and the set fell over and landed, and missed, missed me and crashed over the, the Yorkshire pit. The, oh my God. the boulangerie. You almost got killed by the boulangerie. Oh, no, no. 20 minutes, and after 20 minutes, Lapine came to the cast, and he's like, should we stop or should we keep going? And we were like, let's keep going. And the, <laughs> like a rock and roll concert that night. It was fantastic. And Scott told me later he called somebody in London, and he said his career was over, and his career is not over. He's like the leading set designer on Broadway. I got, Malcolm, Malcolm, I got a phone call for singing through a, a wreck as well. <laughs> Malcolm, <laughs> you, phone call. You, Malcolm, you are, I, I, I remember so well, you are like one of the most be beautiful pianists. Do you still play? I play for Melissa a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I do play. I play all the time. Yeah. Oh, my God. Mostly I play for myself. Mostly I play for the people who live in the senior citizens community where my parents live in Charlotte, North Carolina. Oh, I was gonna. I was gonna hope that you come visit me and play for me. I will happily come and play for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, in, in the in the living facility, I'm going to. <laughs> Absolutely. Can I tell Melissa the story? What? So, I'm sorry. Can I tell it, Melissa? Can I tell the story about your mom? I don't know what story. Sure. One of the gigs Melissa and I did together was we did Camelot at the Hollywood Bowl for one performance. She was uh, Guinevere. I was Mordred, and Jeremy Irons was Arthur. And Melissa's parents were in LA and they were sitting through the sing through in the afternoon in the house. And I went down to say hello to them. And Dr. Erico, her father said, she's in really good voice today. And her mother said, I think she's pregnant. And we went to Melissa and she said, are you pregnant? Melissa's like, no, that's impossible. I can't be pregnant. Four days later, she was pregnant. Her mother oh heard it. Isn't that with, a with the first one. <laughs> yeah, that would be my first baby. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. But her mother heard it in her voice before she knew before Melissa. You know, I remember once being in rehearsal at Ca in Camelot. We never talked about this, but do you ever remember, like, uh, Guinevere, of course, being the Queen of England, had a beautiful bed and uh, the, the set, you know, this beautiful bed, and I fell asleep on it in rehearsal one day. <laughs> like, completely fell asleep. People were like, Melissa? <laughs> you know, I was, oh, I, I took the deepest nap of my life in rehearsal. I learned so much from Melissa during her more, though. I remember one day, James Lapine came to us with a question and I was sort of hedging him. And she goes, St St she goes, you're the leading man, speak up, Malcolm. And I, it was important. I learned how to be a leading man from Melissa. She was, uh, you lead the company and uh, she helped me lead the company. You were like my Guinevere. Oh. Well, we Malcolm Getz, I, I, I love you for coming. He just got back from Chicago, Melissa. Yeah, and it's I, okay. I'm happy to see you, Patrick and Melissa. Always good to see you. and. We, we all worship at the Shrine of Melissa. Oh, yeah. stop. Uh, Malcolm directed a concert that I did in January where uh, he was free, I was free. And I, he said, what are you up to? I said, I'm always up to something. And I said, well, you can come to this concert on Saturday. And he goes, what do you do perform? What are you doing? I said, not really sure, but I have the set list and I have a band, but I've never met them. And it's going to be an hour and a half. When we got there, it was like 900 people crammed into a beautiful <laughs> cathedral. And Malcolm and I were like, at soundcheck, he got to directing me. He's like, you stand there. This goes there. Don't do that. Wear this. We were in, so I haven't seen him since that day. We did good, huh? She killed. She, you always kill. You're fantastic. Oh, it was such a good show, and you were such a help. Oh, my God. You are the best. So I'm going to let you two get back to it, but it's good to see you both. And Melissa. Malcolm, I'm coming to New York to see my brother. My brother has six nights at the at, at 54 Below that he sold out. I'm coming in June. I'm going to call you. You better call me. I'm going to I'm going to hold you to that. Oh, I'd love to join you if, if I'm around. We'll see. Yes. yes. Oh, that's great. Thank you, Malcolm. So good to see you, pal. Bye. Oh, I love him. Love him. Well, that's the best. That's the best prank. Well, I said to him, he called. I called him and I said, "Listen, I want you to do. I want you to appear if he." He says, "I'm flying back from Chicago. If I get back, Aww. he said the time." And he goes, "I'm tired, but he, he was he was great." So, okay. So tell me uh, about um, uh, um, what was I going to say? The the Irish the, the thing you're doing now, the dear liar, dear liar, right? Oh yeah. yeah. Well, oh, this is really really interesting. Um, in light of some of the things that we talked about as well, it's almost like. I mean, you've been an actor for a gazillion years. You know how it's like things happen that reflect your life. And then you have a role that somehow is sort of your life or somehow illuminative of where you're at in your life. I guess you, at best, our profession continues to uh, uh, give us opportunities to bring our new life experiences to work and it keeps going. We don't uh, sort of trip and fall out of it. This play comes to me at a time where I'm assessing 
the, the ingenue characters in my life, all the Venuses and the Elizas and so on, that what do you do now if you've been an ingenue forever? And what are my next steps? Yes, I'm writing. Yes, I'm doing concerts and so on. Then Irish rep calls me and they say, we want you to do this play. The uh, only uh, other person who did it here was Marion Seldes. Marion, one of my mentors in my life, one of my, the women I love the most, um, quick aside that when I was a little girl, my mother spotted her in a restaurant and said, that's a great actress. You want to be an actress. This is the real thing. This is a real New York actress, not a celebrity. This is the thing. So I, she says, go up and say hello to her. Um, and I was so like, oh, and, and, and we don't see, I don't know celebrities or anything. So I went up to Miss Seldes and I said, hello, I hear you are a famous actress and I really want to be an actress. What do I do? And she turned and looked at me and she said, live. <laughs> live. Oh, spot on. So anyway, so I'm doing this play that she did, you know, to, to great renown. And it's called Dear Liar. It's about Mrs. Patrick Campbell, the great English actress who was 50, and her relationship to George Bernard Sh Bernard Shaw. He wrote Eliza for her. She was in her early 50s when she played it. She was 50 when she played it. And she just said, I'm too old for this. This is an ingenue role. This is a girl's part. And he said, no, you can do this. And he was very much in love with her. And they wrote letters to each other throughout their, their lives until they were old. It's an amazing play based on their correspondence. Mm. So you hear all of their relationship, their dreams, their attraction for each other. She's a widow at one point. She's very, very, uh, you know, looking for love. She's, she's clearly coming on to him. Um, mm -hmm. He is uh, married to Mrs. Shaw. He's obviously totally in love with her. And he writes Eliza for her. And so there's a part of the play where I'm playing the character and I'm struggling with the Cockney accent. I'm, tr I'm struggling to seem 22, which I was once. So it's just wonderful that this play has come back in my life. It's to a full circle. Yes, but it's sophisticated now. It's, a, it's about letters. It's about time passing. It's about the choices we make. It's about taking on the role um, as a mature woman. Um, but an actress is an actress. You can tell this story just so. Just, when, just, do you, when do you open? How long is the run? The, uh, it starts on April 25th, and then it goes for, uh, I mean, it's guaranteed to go for the first, it's supposed to be a week. Mm -hmm. you know and so it will run if it if if it can you know right right right, right. that's yeah. great oh yeah. great i will if it's still there in june maybe i'll come if it's so oh, i don't think so i have so much to do no 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 i, I couldn't tell, possibly but yeah tell um i want to show uh because we have a I, we have a little game that we play but i want to so during covid right you did the online stephen sondheim 90th birthday celebration right I did. Well, I, want, I want to show a little clip of that because it's extraordinary. One of my favorite songs ever from Sunday in the Park. Yeah. You would have liked her. Honey, I'm wrong. You would have loved her. Mama enjoyed things, Mama was smart. See how she shimmers, I mean from the heart. I know, honey, you don't agree, but this is our family tree. Just wait till we're there and you'll see. Listen to me. Mama was smart. Listen to Mama. Children and art. Children and art. Oh, I just can't, I can't even, I can't even, I can't even look at it without thinking like it was the pandemic. My husband was sick in the basement for a month. They asked me to do that. 
I had the teenager, I had three preteens. It was like little women, you know, he's off the civil war, but it was just the basement. And I had the three girls and we were cooking and cleaning and self-schooling and talking about our feelings and danger outside. And mm. yeah. Look at that. I love those girls. Like you can't believe. I understand. Yeah. I have, I have it with, I have that relationship with two boys, although they're much older, but I get it. You know, you know, Steve, as we come to know him, um, mm. I, I got, I actually, his last year of life, I, I had so much correspondence with him because he did, he agreed to do the 38 year reunion uh, show on this, on this um, tele, on this uh, talk show of assassins. So everybody was on it, including Jerry Zaks and John Weidman and Paul Gemignani and Victor Garver and Terry Mann and Deborah Monk and Steve. And, and, and from that, we, we talked a lot. I got to know Jeff, his husband for, and I mean, it was really extraordinary, extraordinary. And of course, you know, like yourself, um, I know you've got the, uh, the, the um, you're doing, uh, you have the album or the, the show No One Is Alone that you're doing. Oh, the Sondheim Sublime, right. There's your album. That's, a, that's an album I made about his music um, in 2017. Uh, that was an album. He also uh, corresponded with me quite, quite a bit. When I started writing in the Times, he uh, decided to comment on everything I wrote and send me these complicated responses. Uh -huh. uh, mostly complimentary, but also if I had been affectionate or generous to someone that he didn't like. He, <laughs> he let you know. <laughs> he said that I was more generous than he was. <laughs> so, uh, but it was really interesting because uh, there were two people. There was him and, and uh, Marilyn Bergman. They, sure. they just, they, I would always expect I'd write something and get a, re, a, a complex and, and uh, introspective or a, a illuminative sort of letter. Anyhow, I did make an album called Sondheim Sublime. Mm -hmm. And that is not a CD, an album that tries to be all things Sondheim. But similar to the performance I gave there on the 90th, which was me singing to one of my tracks, I meant it to have a trance like quality. Uh, Steve talks sometimes about how he would fall into states of concentration and lose track of time and place, mm. um, that he would not hear the world around him. He wrote um, musicals sometimes in public places and restaurants and didn't hear a thing. Mm -hmm. 11 hours would go by and he felt like one, like he would fall into these, these, these spells. And I, thought a little bit about that, Steve Reich's influence um, from a musical standpoint, and not to be too uh, personal nor glum in any way, but I had been sick. I had had a tumor and I was scared and I had little children. And so I decided to make an album that I thought would be my uh, letter to my peers, people like you and Malcolm and people I love who would understand it. And it would be my letter of whatever I've learned on this earth. Mm. And I decided that it would be Steve's words. So the sublime and the idea of these healing and beautiful rhythms, that the words and wisdom would flow in an empathic and maternal and sensual way. Nobody's eyes, no, you know, no, nothing dark, but just always music that I could relate to that I felt was sensual and uh, philosophical. Mm. Like maybe I you know, maybe like, so children in art, move on, goodbye for now, uh, obviously send in the clowns, but I remember is there. And I worked with some people who are jazz musicians. So there's sometimes there's a jazzy, um, caressing, right? Mm. Well, well, the whole record is not like Melissa Sondheim record. It's a, it was a prayer and a, a message in a bottle. Well, being that you have that affiliation with him and that connection with him, as do I, we play a little game on this show. Okay. And the name of the game. By the way, I'm all well, and that that was you know knock knock. Every you know, I was put. Oh, through. you're well. You're oh good. Oh yeah. I, I didn't want. I didn't want to get into that, but I'm glad that you are. Good. I was put through a challenge. I think having twins and so on just created a little excitement that had to be addressed. So. So I'm, I, I'm that, no one's happier than me that you're well. Yeah, you. So, um, but anyway, so we normally do this game called Remember the Lyric. And basically what it is, is I give you a lyric from a show you did. I sing the first lyric, I point at you, you come back and me the second one. But in this case, 
We're going to change that game. And we're going to do Remember the Sondheim. So yeah. tonight, for, for tonight's show, I'm going to sing a lyric from a woman Sondheim song, right? And you're going to come back at me. And then you're going to sing a, a song, uh, a lyric from a man Sondheim song. And I'm going to try to come back at you. Got it? So let's. All right. So you're going to give me a girl's line. Right. And then I'm going to know the show and I'm going to shoot you a man, a man's line from that show. No, I, I explained it terribly. I'm going to give you a lyric from one of the Sondheim songs that a woman sings. You're going to give me the line that comes after it because you right. And then you're going to do then you then we're, then you're going to come at me and give me a line, a lyric from a Sondheim show that a man sings. And I'm going to try, try to come back at you. So let's start. I'm going to make it easy. OK, ready? <clears throat> Here it is. Stop worrying if your vision is new. Let others make that decision. They usually do. I wish Perfect. this was me. <laughs> Perfect. That's it. Perfect. Got that. Okay, now you think of so, uh, of a male song, uh, a song that I made, and I'll try to come back at you, you with the next lyric. Um, okay. Uh, I don't want to choose a good spot in this. Uh, Well, uh, keep keep a tender distance. Keep a tender distance. Oh gosh, no! Keep a tender distance. Keep a tender. Oh, I know it, and I don't know it. I mean, I know this this lyric. Keep a tender distance. It's, it's it's it was a cut song from Company. Keep a tender distance, so we'll both be free. Free, That's yes, free. yes. Oh no, Maybe. I know. Maybe I should have given you more. You want me to give you another one? Um, sure. Like. Um, Uh, Wait, I have one more for you. Okay. Okay, here we go. Ready? It's going to be fun. Part of me is everybody here because if everybody's here, I want to thank you all for coming to the wedding. I'd appreciate you going even more. I mean, you must have had better things than you. Not a word of it to Paul. Remember, Paul, you know, the man I'm going to marry. But I'm not because I wouldn't ruin anyone as wonderful as he is. So I thank you all for the gifts. And <laughs> <laughs> I was so thinking I was going to stump you. No, there's no stumping. Okay, now we're going to do a big one, though. We're going to see how far we go with this one. You ready? Here we go. Mm -hmm. Careful the things you say, children will listen. Well, I think that there's a, multiple verses that you could be on, but, uh, <laughs> but you know, if the things you say, children will listen. Careful the uh, things you do would be the first time, so that because you to differentiate, children will see and learn. Right. Children, children will obey, but children will listen. <laughs> Which we all know is not children. Children don't listen at all. But <laughs> you, I was trying, just so you know. See, part of this is so self-serving because I've gotten to sing with Kelly O'Hara. I've gotten to sing with Patty Lapone. I've gotten to sing with Audrey McDonald. I get to now sing with Melissa Erica, and I was trying to sing a full song. <laughs> That was awesome. Thank you for doing that. Oh, I was waiting for like like pie lyrics, or we, but I'm, we were only doing my shows. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, then I'm good. Then I'm good. Oh, I was getting nervous about like your know, worst pies in London or something. No. <laughs> By the way, have you ever? You've never. Have you done that part? No. I haven't. That's the beginning of my Nancy period. I'm gonna right. have to get into you know because of my Cockney background. Right. Um, I'm now. I'm now equipped for any Cockney character of all uh, for my future. <laughs> That's <laughs> right, you are, sir. So I'm sorry. No, right, you are, sir. I don't oh, just yeah. like sing. <laughs> um, so you recorded nine solo albums. Is that correct? Including your, you just released one last year. Maybe I mean that makes sense. I don't count them, but but I'm really I have so many in my head too. So I don't even think about them, that. I, this is really where I'm very fertile right now. I have a lot of ideas about um, music. Um, out of out of the dark, the film noir project. So that, noir that, project. that sounds exciting. We have we well, have something we have something from that too. Show that, Jules. Thank you. Smooth road. Clear day, but why am I the only one traveling? 
traveling this way. The key to this project for me started How in college. I took a film studies class and they showed a film noir movie and it was called Refifi. I loved the music, I loved the atmosphere, I loved the European feeling of this movie. This is in the 50s. I clocked for myself that film noir is something that I love. Don't blame it on my heart. Blame it on my you. Melissa Erico, you are stunning. You are absolutely stunning. Oh, thank you. Mm. Wow, that was great. How did that project come about? That project is the pandemic again. The project is, is, is yes, I, I, I did fall in love with intellectually at Yale. I was an art history major. Everything I've done has had a, um, a visual aspect to it, like the sublime of Sondheim's sublime. The mm -hmm. sublime movement in art history is the movement where beauty meets terror. Wow. Beauty and terror. And so I talked to Sondheim about the idea of Sondheim sublime. He knew what I was going through. He doesn't like the word sublime because he had a sort of Bette Midler idea about it. He thought it was like sublime or for him it had a disco quality. I just mm -hmm. he didn't understand that Wordsworth and not that he didn't, under, he didn't understand. He, he always gave me trouble about it. He said it was camp. Um, um, the word. And so we never agreed on it, but he did understand what I was trying to do. But um, so I have, I couldn't convince him of this art movement, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> we had enough fun and enough agreement, but uh, uh, film noir is uh, an art uh, artistic expression that comes out of German expressionism, which was um, uh, a film movement uh, that happened in Hollywood during the Second World War. It was defined in the 50s by a French film critic, Nino Franck, who was writing about les, les films noirs from America. He was looking back five to 10 years at films, films noir, he, the dark movies that were made during the Second World War. Everyone liked that. And so they've applied it backward to those films of that time. So it's not like people were making film noir movies. They were making these dark movies with German people and many uh, Jewish uh, directors in Hollywood with very European sensibilities. And the, the, uh, the sensibility of film noir is that we're all separated, mm -hmm. isolated, existentially confused, living in a dark world where we don't see uh, that we have any control over our destiny, where politicians are corrupt. Really? Uh, this is an existential uh, art movement. These are not crime movies. These are not gangster movies. The film noir movies are movies that are um, uh, poetic statements about urban life, empty streets, uh, rain-soaked streets, a person alone with a cigarette, late nights, nobody's around, mm -hmm. nobody can find each other, people are separated um, I, and uh, longing for each other. So film noir, while I was watching these movies during the pandemic, um, as the pandemic progressed. And I was like, wow, I always loved this, but this is the pandemic. This is another darkest time in human history kind of thing. So I started learning that and I did a, uh, an event for the French Institute in New York. And then I curated a film festival where I talked about the films with Adam Gopnik from the New Yorker magazine. We co-curated it. And we had such a good time that at one of the film talkbacks, a fan, there were lots and lots of people on the uh, Zoom said, you really should do a record because you know all this now and you've created, by the way, I created my own noir concept, which is there really isn't noir music, but noir is a sensibility. It's a, it's a, it's a sensibility. If you don't know what it is, it's almost hard to explain, but I created what I would call noir music, even though it's a, it's really up for debate what noir even is. Well, congratulations. I mean, it sounds <laughs> no, but seriously, it's it's, ama it's amazing. Like I said, it's, it's, fa it's, it's stunning it's, to watch you. It's so interesting to perform it because I perform it like a housewife in Bronxville, which you know <laughs> I also am. 
who's falling into these movies in the pandemic and she sees herself, you know, like in this film and lost on the street in Paris. And so it's really just like a fantasy. The kids are asleep and I'm in a noir movie. <laughs> and I want to so, ask, I want to ask you before we, cause I know, I know you have a, a heart out and we have, I want to, I want to ask you and, and also plug some of your things. So everybody asks me all the time, you know, what, what my relationship was like with my mom. They ask, you know, what was what was David in her relationship? Because she was his stepmom, blah, 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 blah. So I've got to ask this. What's your relationship like with your brother-in-law? It's good. It is? Is he? By the, way, by the way, tell Patrick, I'm such a fan, such a fan, not just of his name, but of him. Uh, he's, I think he's one of the best commentators I've ever seen in, in terms of, I mean, look at that. And obviously three beautiful daughters. Three Such beautiful daughters. We're but married also, 20 but also, years. But I'm also a big fan of John's too. I think they're both. Yeah. Well, they're very different. Um, and, you know, it's a big legacy to follow. Um, as I have a young tennis player in my fam in my house, and you were an athlete, you would remember, there, there's a lot of pressure just built into excelling at all. Never right. mind you excel in an environment in which you're expected to excel. Right. And Patrick had that pressure. He was a young tennis player and his brother was world famous because um, he's the youngest brother and there's a middle brother. Mm -hmm. so, um, you know, so I'm, I'm protective of Patrick because I uh, love him and because I have known him since I was little. I met Patrick when I was in kindergarten. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> his mother, his mother saw me in My Fair Lady when I was 22. And she said to Patrick, you really should look up Melissa for <laughs> nursery school. She's Italian. You know, you knew I was an Italian. They're uh -huh. Irish, you know, they're Irish and they come from pull your bootstraps kind of family. Yeah, sure. We do not come from fancy. My mother doesn't understand how I, I come across, you know, as a, a duchess type, type of thing. <laughs> Just, You're just, smart, Melissa. You're very smart. Well, it's very their fault. I, I like books. I guess books gave me some refinement, but I do not come from anything like the upper class in any way. Um, so, and the McEnroes are really from Queens and they work their butts off. And the McEnroes and the Ericos growing, you know, coming up through the 70s and the 80s, and they loved each other. We have pictures of our mothers flipping hamburgers in their early 30s together at the fall fair. Hmm. Or in their high boots, you know, hanging out at the football game or the, the soccer game. Um, anyhow, so I've known Patrick for absolutely ever. I knew John when I was little. So I love John, but John doesn't see me as an accomplished actress. Well, he does, but he doesn't see me uh, in the celebrity light. He knows me as a girl from Buckley who married his brother. <laughs> good, good. And, um, and who sing, does, he, does, he, does he acknowledge what a beautiful singer you are? Oh, yeah. He married a singer, though. He's yeah. amazing. No, he's so supportive. You know, he really, I can't, I can't say enough nice things about, about him. I've lo I, I love his wife and I love his children. And um, I think when I came into the family 25 years plus ago, um, but mostly 25 because we got married really quickly. Um, I think I was a good influence because the family been through a lot. His fame is a lot. There's another brother. There's so many children. Um, and uh, Mrs. McEnroe and Mr. McEnroe. Mr. McEnroe are not with us anymore, but I love them to pieces. And I think they were better at being grandparents by the time they got to their ninth, 10th and 11th grandchild. And um, so I had them over a lot and I threw parties a lot and I organized Thanksgiving a lot. So I think John appreciates that, but he's the best host. I just organize when we're going to do it. And then Patty, his wife has the most beautiful home, cooks and loves to be um, a hostess. So I think I've been good for the Macro family, so I think I hope well, I think let, I have. Let yeah, me I have. let me let me not forget. Before we go, before we go, let me not, not forget. I want to forget that next uh, next week you are getting the Bistro Award. Is that correct? Yeah, for the album that you we just talked about. It was a, a recognition for the concept, of, the concept of the film noir album. Yeah. It's uh, they rec they they wrote a beautiful, um, you know, congratulations. I don't know if they always have a concept re award, but that was really nice. They said it was evocative and haunting, and um, you know, e each time you make a record, you should have an idea. It's I think it's nice. It's good to have a real idea. You know. Well, I wanna I wanna I wanna just uh, tell everybody on May first, you are celebrating Rita Gardner at Fifty Four Below in New York City on May fourth. 
Uh, you remember Stephen Sondheim at Coachella Valley Rep in Palm Springs. And on May 6th, an evening of Michael Legrand, Michelle Legrand and Stephen Sondheim in Burlington, Ohio. And May 20th, the Stardust Gala in, in Bing, Bing, is it Binghamton? Binghamton, New York. But anyway. Binghamton, um, yeah. And then so, actually two days after that, I leave for Paris where I'm doing two concerts in Paris. I'll never, I'll never be able to get you to come to, to Tennessee. Never. Uh, <laughs> no, you will, but not not in the short term. No. <laughs> but um, then I'm going to England to do the. Um, I think you skipped the uh, Montreal Jazz Festival. Where oh I'm, I'm opening for George Benson. Oh my gosh! That's I, look, at, look at you. It's amazing. I can't believe that. I can't believe one day I'm going to say I opened for George Benson the other day. So I'm well, just I'm very appreciative. You know I don't know what's. I don't, I don't really know what's going on in life, but I have met Marilyn May, you know, re, in the last few months I wrote about her. She's 95 and she said, Melissa, don't have a plan. Don't worry about anything. Say yes to everything. Yes, yeah. Take your vitamins and keep moving. That's right. Um, we play one more game. It's a sort of a sign off game. It's called you become the host, which means you get to ask me one question, any question, I won't tell you what Patty Lapone asked me. We worked together twice, so it was it was quite fun. But any question you want, you get to ask. What do you love about your new hometown? Oh my gosh, the job and the people. The people that I've met, that I've come in contact with, have been everything that they talk about that southern hospitality thing, and then some huh. generous beyond belief, kind, uh, considerate, and mm. compassionate. Um, like some of the best friends I've ever met, really, really, truly. And the job, I, I, I feel like I'm, you know, the artistic director of a theater, of a theater company, and still Tennessee is eager, Middle Tennessee is eager to learn about theater, as well as embrace what they have already learned. So it's been great. Yeah, that's wonderful. It seems like you're on another amazing chapter. Yeah, I, I feel right. very, blessed, very blessed. I'm all about the chapters. I mean, we got to do that, right? So congratulations. Oh. Yeah, you are you are splendid. I I, I promise uh, we will have a third, fourth, fifth meeting, and and I will be just just as enthralled with you. Are thank you so much for doing the show. Oh my God, thank you, and thank you for bringing Malcolm and for all these kind things you said that Julie organized. You know, it makes me feel like I'm in show business. And after all these years, we've been through these ups and downs. It's just so nice to be a part. So thank yeah. you. Thank I'll you. speak to you soon. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that's our show tonight, ladies and gentlemen. It's so great. Gosh, amazing, Melissa Erico. Thank you so much for being here. I want to talk a little bit about um, what we have coming up. Okay. On May 17th, here you come again. Premiere of Dolly Parton's brand new show. It features all of her songs, everyone from Jolene, 9 to 5, the song Here You Come Again. I'll always love you. It is such a great story. Uh, it's about this guy during the pandemic. He's a comedian who gets fired. He's forced to go to his uh, his parents' house and he quarantines up in the attic, right? And he's a huge fan of Dolly Parton and he's losing all hope and he prays to her and she comes and visits him in the attic and through the next hour and a half convinces him that his life is fantastic. It's beautiful, wonderful heart culture. We open that on May 17th at the Franklin Theater. And then after that, we're doing the classic Rodgers and Hammerstein, The Sound of Music. And that is going to be an incredible thing. That's June 22nd. And then we are opening our brand new theater in the fall and, and we're announcing the season. So it's going to be great. Um, thank you, Julie Garnier. You're the best. Uh, love you, love you, love you. Thank you, Melissa Erico. Thank you, guys. We'll see you in a month. I appreciate it. Goodbye for tonight.